Welcome, I'm Jeremiah Reiner, and this is the Deeply Rooted Podcast. Welcome back to the Deeply Rooted Podcast. This is Jeremiah Reiner, your host, and we've got some special episodes lined up for you in the next couple of ones that we're going to be releasing. We just finished up our Deeply Rooted Conference for 2024 this past early November, and we want to bring to you all of those sessions that we were able to record. We're going to lead off here with our first one, which was the Q&A session on the Friday night to kick things off. We had Brother Tim Challies with us. We had Brother Justin Peters. We also had our good friend Travis Hilton and our conference director Justin Bice for this interview. So we hope you enjoy. Need them. So, <laughs> but uh, to my right here we have Brother uh, Tim Challies, all the way from Toronto, Canada. We have a good brother of mine, uh, Brother Travis Hilton. Uh, Travis from Crystal Spring Baptist Church there in Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, Brother Justin Bice is going to be with us tonight as well uh, from here in Kingsport, Tennessee. And then we've got Brother uh, Justin Peter here on the end with us uh, this evening. So thank you guys for coming on out and being a part of this. We'll get started, and uh, I'll try to work my way around as best we can. But uh, I want to lead off with the first question here tonight, and I'll kick it off. Uh, we've got two Justins, so I'm going to use first and last names here for them. So I'll start with Justin Peters uh, down at the end. What would you consider to be the most abused aspect of the Holy Spirit today? Oh, goodness, that um, the most abused aspect of the Holy Spirit. I would say in some sense, it's kind of embedded in his name, holy. It's it's been a fascinating observation of mine that. In the charismatic movement, you have the movement that is that boasts, they claim to have the highest view of the Holy Spirit, the most intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. They claim to hear him speak with the same clarity that you are hearing my voice right now. They are in constant communication with the Holy Spirit. And yet, in the charismatic movement, that, that movement is the welcoming home to the most egregious heretics, the most obvious charlatans and hucksters, and quite frankly, the most immoral people that have ever disgraced the name of Christ. Uh, you look at the entire history of the char- bug. You look at the entire history of the charismatic movement, and all of their leaders uh, throughout the the hundred and 18 or so year uh, length of this movement. All of their leaders, the people that they call God's generals, would include people like John Alexander Dowie, Charles Fox Parham, Amy Simple McPherson, Catherine Kuhlman, Smith Wigglesworth, uh, John G. Lake, others. Those are just some of the more prominent names. You look at all these men and women and to a man, to a woman, they were all hucksters, complete frauds. They were objective heretics, prolific false prophets, and almost all of them, if not all of them, were sexually immoral. Uh, in the case of Charles Fox Parham, he was even a pedophile. And he is one of their most revered generals, God's generals. So... Yeah, I would say it's it's almost embedded in his name. It is this movement that has the most unholy people, and yet they claim to have the highest view of the Holy Spirit. So uh, there is very there's just a, a, an egregious acceptance and tolerance of sin in the charismatic movement. Tim, how do you think in a local church setting that we combat that week in and week out? Preach the word. I suppose we uh, simply preach what the word of God says and trust that as we preach it rightly, um, people will understand um, who the Holy Spirit is and how we're to relate to him. 
Um, I think as we as we study scripture, if I were to give a maybe a follow up answer to that, I might say that one of the concerns I have is the preeminence of the Holy Spirit in some Christian traditions. Um, the Holy Spirit is is God. He's um, co-equal with the Father and the Son, and yet it seems that his his joy is to constantly point people away from himself to the son who in turn points people away from himself to the father and yet in many of these theological traditions it's all about the spirit and experiences of the spirit and they seem like they could do without the father like almost like they could do without the son as long as they can have the spirit but i I don't get the sense from scripture that the holy spirit wants that preeminence within the godhead he's eager to point people to the saving work of jesus christ who in turn is eager to point people to the glory of god the father Travis, I want to point this next one to you. You actually, and we've talked about this before, and if you haven't heard, we've done a podcast with Travis before and and kind of gave his background and testimony. You came out of the charismatic movement. Uh, You were sort of died in the wool, so to speak, there. Um, As a pastor today, because you dealt so long with, with talking about gifts of the Spirit, how would you counsel believers to recognize their actual spiritual gifts and then using them? In their local church. Well, I think. Hope this is on. I. Uh, it can be complicated sometimes because we all come from different backgrounds. How to guide them, and you know, it, it takes a lot of teaching on this subject because I think some people have expectations that they have this special gift, and that's the only gift that they have. I think sometimes there's that. Which, by the way. The, the prominent in, in true gospel churches, the spillover, the influence of the charismatic movement, and I say as, as being formerly charismatic, is that a lot of gospel churches have elements of charismatic belief in them now. And, it, and, and that's the difficulty because people have already been discipled by people that they've, they've watched on television or maybe they came out of a church that had already had charismatic teaching so it's almost like you're you're trying to reteach to help them understand you know one we don't want to be here's the sin being presumptive about the holy spirit presuming things you know sometimes god gives us opportunities and gifts and enablements for particular moments to do things to say things just as as jesus told his disciples that he was going to give them the words to say at particular times when they stood before uh, courts and were, were, to be ready for that. So there's the, this kind of, that kind of readiness where we, we are enabled by the Holy Spirit, but it's not that we're assigned this one specific gift and that's the only gift that God ever uses. And because I took a spiritual gifts inventory, which I think I, I, I question the, the validity of it at times because then people sometimes think that's the only thing that God has me to do or, or that's that's my calling so i don't do anything else you know like when it's time to clean the toilets in the church you know things like that They're, those are gifts of help those things that god has called us all to do so th- just to say that you know there's the understanding that there, there are certain gifts that were for a particular time in the new testament in uh, amongst the apostles the the giftings that we we see there of prophecy and and um you know, and that uh, the manifestation of glossolalia, all of those things were uh, for a particular time. But there, there is a way that God uses the gifts by the fruit of the Spirit manifested in our lives. Goodness, kindness, self-control, love, gentleness, all those things that are really the important things to focus upon and how that's manifesting through love, the things that we do. Hope that helps. Yeah. Uh, I'll go to Justin Boss for follow-up on that. What kind of caution would you give, particularly probably to young believers, as they're searching out these spiritual gifts and praying to the Lord that he would reveal these things to them in their roles within the local church and their own Christian walk? Thanks for putting me on the spot with some questions I Anytime. haven't reviewed yet. <laughs> um, but, 
No, it's not something that everybody immediately knows as soon as they get saved how they are going to be serving and what gifting they've been given. So many people think just because, let's say, someone's a school teacher and then they get saved, they think, oh, well, you're going to be a teacher. No, that was a gifting you had before you were ever even a Christian. So it's oftentimes it's something that we need to... Uh, we, we pray about. We use the ordinary means of grace that the Holy Spirit is the one who is inspiring the word, the preached word, the read word, the sung word, the physical word in baptism and in the Lord's Supper. Those are the things that he uses to sanctify us and to teach us. And he reveals what those giftings are through those ordinary means through the word that he's inspired. Yeah, that's good. Can I speak to that? Person? Yes, absolutely. Um, first, when we talk about spiritual gifts, I'm always impressed at how many people, what percentage of people believe their gifting is in the front of the room where everybody can see them versus the great majority of the work in the church needs to be done, which is out of sight. I've yet to have somebody come and say, my spiritual gift is cleaning the church. But I know lots of people whose spiritual gift is preaching, teaching, leading worship, and so on, or so they're convinced. So I think whenever we, we want to consider how we, God may have gifted us, we have to really interrogate ourselves to see, am I just wanting a place of prominence in front of the church so I can be seen and affirmed? But um, you mentioned spiritual gift inventories. I'm a huge believer in them, but I think we've got them backwards. Look at the church and see what needs to be done. There's your inventory. Inventory the needs of the church and start to do it. And um, where there's a need, you start to act in that way. And maybe God will give you the gift. Maybe the Spirit will give you that gifting as you act. We like to think, I'll sit still, you gift me, and then I'll start doing. How about you just identify a need? There are children who need to be taught, or there are carpets that need to be cleaned, or there are uh, people who need to be reached, uh, doors that need to be knocked on. I'll start to do that. And lo and behold, I think you might find that the gifting soon follows your your availability before the Lord. Yeah, that's good. You know, uh, just piggybacking on that, the idea of teaching. Well, every parent is charged by God to teach their children. Teaching may not be their spiritual gift, but me as a father, whether I have that gift or not, I am still called by God to do that. And maybe he'll use that. Maybe that is my spiritual gift. And he uses me teaching my family to reveal that maybe that's a gift to the church. But just because something, oh, that's not my gift. I'm not going to be doing that today. I'm sorry, cleaning those toilets, not my gift. I'm not going to be doing that today. I can't teach. No, that's not my spiritual gift. No, we get in, we work on it. We, We do it in our family. We do everything in our family, right? And he often uses that to reveal how we're serving the church. That's a good point. Um, I'm going to go back to Justin uh, Peters here for this one. Like a lot of movements, there's some lingo that tends to get thrown out that, for lack of a better term, it's it's a little wonky sometimes. Uh, One of those in particular I wanted to ask you about, you hear this in certain circles, and I wanted to specifically give you some time to respond to it, but what is meant by the term slain in the spirit? Yeah, so uh, being slain in the spirit, I I would say that along with tongues, along with healing, are probably the three most um, widely recognized activities connected with the charismatic movement. But we've all seen this on TV, right? You've probably maybe even seen it in person when Benny Hinn or whoever the preacher is goes up to someone and either blows on them or waves his coat at them or touches them on the head, and they fall over backwards. They talk about, they call that being slain in the spirit. Uh, number one, it's unbiblical. I mean, that, that's the real question. Is this biblically sound? And it's not. They would point to a couple of different texts. One would be Matthew 17 at the transfiguration um, and the disciples when you read the text carefully, I believe the disciples just voluntarily lowered themselves. They went face down on the ground. They didn't fall over backwards. They went. They lowered themselves on the ground face forward. And uh, so that doesn't 
that doesn't work. And the other would be at the arrest of Jesus in John 19. And the Roman soldiers came and uh, Jesus said, whom do you see? Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am. And they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, admittedly, that's probably the, the one event in the Bible that looks most closely like being slain in the spirit is what we see in charismatic churches. But who were these people who were doing being slain, you know, falling over backwards? Were they Christians? No, no. These were the Roman soldiers coming to arrest Jesus. So you can't take that text as biblical support for something that we as Christians should be doing today. No, those were unbelievers, obviously. So you can't use that either. Um, it's interesting. Anytime in the Bible someone falls or goes down face forward uh, in the presence of God, it's always in worship. But anytime somebody falls backwards in the presence of God, it's always in judgment. It's always in judgment. So it's not a good thing. Okay, You don't want to be slain in the spirit as we see from the charismatics. That's not an experience after which I would be seeking. And uh, I, I suppose the other one would be Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. They were slain by the spirit, <laughs> not necessarily in the spirit. Uh, and, you know, we weren't there, but in all likelihood, they probably fell over backwards. So that's not, um, yeah, being slain in the spirit is not a, a biblical concept at all. It is What's going on there, peer pressure, group dynamics, mind over body. It's just that charismatics have seen this practice for decades. They know what's expected, and, sub, sub, and so subconsciously they do the same thing. I was... I myself was, quote unquote, slain in the spirit when I was a teenager and going to see faith healers when I went to see a went to a Nora Lamb crusade. Uh, she came up to me and my buddy, who was also crippled, but she uh, came up to us and we were the last ones in line. Well, we had already seen about 100 other people slain in the spirit. And so when she came up and touched me on the head, I kind of subconsciously fell backwards, too. It was just a subconscious thing. It's psychosomatic, mind over body. So there's nothing spiritual about it at all. Sticking with the lingo on that line, something that I think probably needs a little bit more attention. Uh, I'll throw this one out to Travis if you'd like it. But the Bible does talk about Christians being filled with the Holy Spirit. A, what does that mean? And B, does that happen at multiple times in our lives? That is a really good question. And, you know, I could start with the wrong answers because I think what pulled me in to the charismatic movement was the desire for more of the spirit in my life. I was raised in a Baptist church that preached the word. And um, when the, the pastor was absent, there was a you know chasm in leadership in the church. And I was a teenager, older teenager. Hungry for God and uh, had a friend that was going to a charismatic church here in Kingsport, uh, Tennessee. I was raised in Hilton's. So I left my Baptist church to start going to this church that taught about being filled with the Holy Spirit. It wasn't like, you know, classical Pentecostalism saying that you being filled with the Spirit is, uh, you know, you've got to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, to have the initial evidence, you know, speak in tongues and have that, that would be the initial evidence of being filled. It was a little easier uh, sell uh, to say that you need to be filled with the Spirit, and yet the same, man similar manifestations would be expected. And so it took me on a journey uh, trying to seek that, and that you've been filled with the Spirit. So there's different versions, obviously, of that, that people think that that is... <coughs> The manifestation of being filled with the spirit. But we all, if we've come to saving faith in Christ, we've we have the spirit. We've been sealed uh, until the day of redemption, according to Ephesians chapter one. He is the guarantee of our inheritance. And uh, I just can't. Is it OK for me to say this? I'm going to take too long, but uh, it just so happens that I was underlining as uh Justin was uh, reading 
the uh, scripture from Romans, which is worth uh, hearing. But you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I don't think it's by accident that I you didn't know that I was underlining that at the almost the exact same time you were reading it of all this, this, the passages. I don't, I don't. Could you see me over there doing that? They saw me doing it. So. But what's important about that is that we have the spirit and the thing that I was missing was that the spirit is continually filling us as we seek him and trust him. And um, and, and being filled is a daily dependence upon God because he is our father and we call on him as Abba father and he will give us what we need as we trust him and um, and we can trust him for everything. Uh, and that's. So the feeling comes at his discretion because he knows what we need by his grace, his special grace to his children. And we can depend upon that. Justin Bice, and you don't have to give a ton of examples here, but I think a lot of people miss this. Does the Holy Spirit have a role in the Old Testament? Well, he inspired every book. Right. Um, we see it over and over again. Um, David, throughout the Psalms specifically, we see the Spirit coming up on someone like Saul and then being removed. And taking that out of context makes a lot of Christians fearful. Oh, will God take His Holy Spirit from me? No. But it was it was a different instance. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is a new covenant promise that we are sealed by the third member of the Godhead as he is applying the work of the second member of the Godhead at the initiation of the first member of the Godhead. Our our salvation being triune means that, yes, guess what? Abraham, saved, sealed by the Holy Spirit. Adam, Sealed by the Holy Spirit. And it's no difference than Jeremiah or Tim or anybody. It's the same manifestation, the same person doing this. The eternal third member of the Trinity. That's good. Anybody got a follow up to that? That's the one here uh, before we move on. Can I follow up on the filled with the Holy Spirit thing? Please. Going back one, but I just wanted to add to that that I think the filling of the Spirit is displayed in the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, So I wouldn't want to disconnect those those concepts. As you're looking across all of Scripture, the Spirit's work is many. Um, But, you know, how can you know if you're filled with the Spirit? In the charismatic world, that's shown through utterances or through miracles or through something else. Um, You know, all these great ecstatic experiences that seem to show that you've been filled with the Spirit. But biblically, I think we understand we're filled with the Spirit when we're displaying the fruit of the Spirit. And so his fruit ripens in our lives and we begin to then display love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and so on. And so if you want to know if you're filled, look for the fruit. And where there's fruit, there's filling. That's good. Um, I'll finish up here with Justin if anybody wants to follow in on this as well. By all means, do this. This is more practical, um, especially for uh, leading in churches. But how can a Christian recognize the guidance of the Holy Spirit, particularly in decision making? You know, we live in a day and age where a lot of people talk constantly about uh, praying about things, making decisions wisely. How would you counsel people and leaning in on the Holy Spirit and helping in that? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. You know, so if you kind of encapsulate it, basically, how do I know God's will for my life? Or how, you know, if I've got a decision to make and I don't know if I should choose A or B, you know, how do I know God's will? What does He want me to choose? Well, if you want to know God's will for your life, I really want to kind of demystify this for you and make it much simpler read study and obey god's word that's number one if you're not doing that nothing else matters anyway so read study and obey god's word pray for wisdom james chapter one if any of you lacks wisdom let him ask of god now if you're not doing step number one 
don't even bother asking God for wisdom. He's not going to give it to you. But if you are, if you're reading, studying, and obeying God's word, pray for wisdom. And then uh, seek wise, godly counsel. Proverbs says there's safety or wisdom in a multitude of counselors. And so if you've got a decision that you need to make and you're not sure what to do, go to some people in your life, some um, people that you know that are trustworthy and walking honorably and holy before the Lord and ask them for their counsel. And uh, I, I do that in my life. Now, the first person I'm going to talk to is named Kathy, my wife. She and I are going to talk about it. If I've got some decision or, you know, whatever, I'm, she and I are going to talk about it. But if, if after the two of us talk about it, we both decide, you know, we need some other eyes on this, I've got some men in my life that I'll go to and I'll say, brothers, this is what I'm facing. This is the decision that I've got to make. You know, what is your counsel? And that has served me well in doing that. And um, I appreciate those brothers. So there's wisdom in doing that. So read, study, and obey God's word. Pray for wisdom. Seek godly counsel. And then Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him. And he might direct your paths. You know, he'll, he'll direct your paths if he's got nothing better to do. No, he will direct your paths. He will do that. How does he do that? I don't have the foggiest idea how he does it. I just know that he does. And so just trust in the Lord. Um, so if you're doing these things, studying and obeying God's word, praying for wisdom, seeking godly counsel, then look at the options that you have and... Um, Make a wise decision and do whatever you want to do. Just do whatever you want to do. Um, You don't have to worry, boy, if I choose A instead of B and God really wanted B, then my life is going to collapse like a house of cards. No, he upholds all things by the word of his power. He, He actively sustains the entire universe. I think he can direct our paths. And so just... Rest in him. And it's interesting, even in the New Testament, even in the apostolic age, in the book of Acts, you never see the apostles praying for things like, Lord, show me your specific individual will for my life. They just did stuff. Paul said that he spent the winter at Nicopolis because he thought it best. You know, he's, well, he said, I have decided to spend the winter at Nicopolis. So why did Paul spend the winter at Nicopolis? Because he decided to spend the winter at Nicopolis, and so he spent the winter at Nicopolis. He just did stuff. Now, you do see on occasion the Holy Spirit sovereignly redirecting them, but um, just do stuff. You know, that's what I tell you. Just do stuff. Just read and study and obey God's word. Pray for wisdom. Seek godly counsel. Make a wise decision and just do something and just trust in the Lord that he will he will direct your path. So we we really need to demystify this whole notion of, you know, asking for God's specific will for my life. Just live a life of obedience before the Lord. Uh, you, we know it's God's will for us to be holy, for us to walk in sexual purity, for us to suffer. We know it's God's will for us to suffer for Christ. Uh, it's God's will for us to be sanctified, so just live out the Christian life, and that's God's will for your life. Amen. Any follow-up? Well, also the fact, who is the Holy Spirit? He's the comforter. And He will come alongside us as He is indwelling us, So many people think, well, I'm going to make the wrong decision. There's not a Bible verse that says what kind of car I should buy. There's not a Bible verse that says exactly who I should marry. So what if I make the wrong decision? Well, just like Justin said, you you pray for wisdom, you seek godly counsel, but you also realize that we've got the comforter, the one who comes alongside us and gives us strength. What does comfort mean? It means with strength, calm, fort. Well, Fort Henry, Fort Robinson, that's right here in Kingsport, right? That is a stronghold. 
with strength. Our comforter, the Holy Spirit, will come alongside us. He will testify to us through the word that we are children of God. He will testify that, yeah, we'll do things according to the word of the Lord. And we're going to make bad decisions, too, because what? We're still dragging around this old flesh. And he's, even when I'm going out and sinning, he's going to say, you're trusting in Christ. You are still his. No matter how many times you fail, you're trusting in Christ. Just like uh, I think Tim said earlier, the Spirit always points to the Son. It points to the Father. That's how you know it's the ministry of the Spirit. Amen. Travis, would you pray for us as we close out this session? Can I say one more thing? Please, Hoyt, because since we're, we're loving this panel, right? Um, and I didn't expect this, by the way. I was, uh, <laughs> I, was, I was hoping to make it tonight. I'm glad I did. Because I know still people who are uh, Pentecostal, charismatic. And, and I just want to make it clear. When I say that I know that, that some of those men and women... And maybe they're here tonight. Love Jesus and have trusted Christ as Savior and Lord. But there's lots of different teaching that is mixed in, that's crept into churches that they need to recognize. I'm glad that Justin is going to give us some more uh, understanding of, of what that is. But I do know some who sincerely love the Lord. But... I'm glad that I'm able to talk to them about these things because I think a lot of it starts with salvation. And when I started to look at salvation and what that means and the Holy Spirit's role, it changed a lot of other things for me in understanding how I'm saved and regenerated and and how God continues to work in us by the Holy Spirit. And I just just encourage patience with people that you know, you've been in a church a long time and you've heard a lot of wrong teaching on these things it takes a long time to learn but you can help someone lovingly show them the scriptures and help them i just wanted to say that you know before you pray though what you just said who who up here has the best theology Uh, of any of the fun people up here obviously you think you have the best theology or you would change it i think i have the best theology or i would change it same on down the line here and the best theologian, I think R.C. Sproul said, is only maybe 80% right. So we can look at our brothers and sisters in other denominations, other understandings of gifts, and say, you trust in Christ? Amen. Praise the Lord. you got the same Holy Spirit i got. Hey, you're, you're looking to Christ as your only hope in life and in death? Amen. Me too. We can have a, a waitress at a restaurant. She says, praise the Lord. We can have fellowship right there. Now, we spend a little more time together. We're, we might start disagreeing. We might start arguing. So, oh, well, you believe this. I believe that. It's Christ alone. Amen. And that's what the Spirit points us to. Yes. Now you can pray. Amen. Thank you. Father, thank you, Lord, for this time with all these brothers and sisters here gathered together. Lord, we... We love you. We thank you, God, for how you're you're teaching us, Lord, by your spirit. How could we learn or know anything apart from you opening our hearts, Lord? You've been so good to us that we may just see a glimpse of who you are, Lord. The revelation of Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, fully man, fully God. Lord, lived the perfect life, died in our place on the cross, took the wrath of God on himself, was risen from the dead. And Lord, thank you for the promise that we have that that same Holy Spirit will one day raise us from the dead as we've already been raised to walk in newness of life by your spirit. We give you praise, Father, and we thank you, God, for this wonderful gift that we have lord it humbles us it causes us to walk in fear before you lord it causes us to love our brothers and sisters in christ and even those lord that may be erring and even those who lord may have believed a false gospel and lord need to hear the true gospel we ask that they would 
and that they would believe, Father, here in the Tri-Cities and Lord, throughout Southwest Virginia and East Tennessee, God, thank you for churches that are standing on your truth. And Father, thank you for these men that, Lord, you've sent here to speak to us and pray, God, that you'd continue to bless them. And Father, um, thank you, Lord, for those serving in worship tonight. And thank you, God, for all that we're able to enjoy together in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.